This is a relay project. The discourse starts right now with Cheryl Oates and Erica Baroudis. Welcome to the discourse. There's no shortage of political drama in Alberta as former mayor Nahed Nenshi puts his name forward in the Alberta leadership race. And Mr. Nenshi has agreed to join us here today to talk about his decision to run. Now, as soon as we had him confirmed, we put out a post to our listeners and everybody sent us questions. You guys did not disappoint. We received a really thoughtful list of important questions, and we're going to ask Nahed those questions today, and we're going to jump into it in the next couple of minutes. But first, we could not do this without our partners. It feels like spring outside. Everybody in my neighborhood is already out there cleaning things out and getting things organized, and many have decided that this year is the year they are finally going to clean up and permanently organize their garages. California Closets offers custom garage packages if this is what you're in the market for. It includes drawers, cabinetry, specialty wall racks that keep all of your outdoor toys, seasonal decor, and tools meticulously stored and easily accessible for whenever you need them. For more information, check out californiaclosets.ca and click on Garages. Nahed Nenshi launched his campaign this week, similar to how many of the other NDP candidates have with a video online. Let's take a look. What we need now is smart, credible government. We need a government that respects us. We need a government that we can trust. And sadly, we don't have it. Danielle Smith and her government are not only incompetent, they're immoral and they're dangerous. The only things they know how to do are pick fights and waste money. And while they indulge themselves and their friends, life gets harder for all of us. But it doesn't have to be that way. There is a choice, a better choice. Alberta's New Democrats are that alternative, a party based on values we all share, Alberta values. With your help, we can build on the tremendous legacy of Rachel Notley and all of those who have worked hard for this party. Together, we can beat Danielle Smith and the UCP. Well, let's just jump right into it. Three-time Calgary mayor and now officially an Alberta NDP leadership candidate. Nahed Nenshi, welcome to the discourse. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a thrill to be here with both of you. Bonjour. I did hear that you... Uh, yeah. <laughs> We're going to just jump straight into it. We've asked some uh, listeners for questions, and one of the big ones we got is, Nahed Nenshi, are you a new Democrat? Well, I am now. Uh, I have a card and everything. Well, actually, I don't have a card. It's all on email now. Um, you know, that's probably the single most important question uh, for us to be talking about right now, because I've had this long history of being nonpartisan, of calling the strikes and the balls as best I can, and really just for advocating for the people of Calgary. And so I think it's really fair to ask me, what the heck has happened? You know, is it suddenly you thought orange looks better on you than purple or what? But in reality, you know, I've been on the sidelines and I've enjoyed being on the sidelines. I've enjoyed being a commentator and focusing on building community in the ways that I like, you know, and, and making a great professional career out of that. But I also have been watching very carefully what's going on in Alberta and the real need for a better government, for a more competent, smarter, more credible government, as we're dealing with some very serious crises in the province. And fundamentally, so many people for months now across the province have been reaching out to me saying, why, why, why are you standing on the sidelines? Why don't you jump in? And I started off by looking at people and saying, how would I do in partisan politics? It's, it's not me, it's not my brand. But I've talked to so many New Democrats across the province and so many people who've never voted New Democrat across the province. And I've really been testing them on, well, here's what I believe in, and to determine whether or not they believe in the same things. And what I have found, and I will say a little bit to my surprise, is when I think about the things that are important to me, strong public services, public provision of strong public services, safeguarding the vulnerable, building the economy, supporting both the energy sector and small business and entrepreneurs in our community, taking real action on climate, not just saying net zero by 2050, but not doing anything to get yourself there. And interestingly, balancing the budget and keeping the cost of living low uh, in this community. And I've been surprised how much unanimity there is both among New Democrats and among folks who are searching for a political home. And so I realized almost in spite of myself, that 
you know, if I needed to pick a team to get involved in provincial politics, there was a team that actually met my values and fit my values already. And the real job is to convince more Albertans that these that this team represents their values as well. Yeah, exactly. And I I mean, you and I share that and that that's what I hope for as well, that people watching this leadership race look at it and say, there's a home for me in the NDP as well. Um, I'm wondering for you, like there's it's been some time since you were out of the mayor's chair and, you know, only recently have you sort of started to tiptoe into partisan politics. We saw an endorsement near the end of the last election. Was this something that happened over the course of those years or is this something that's happened more recently that you've you've felt more aligned with partisan politics? No, it's been very, very recent. And, I, and I'm and i still uncomfortable with hearing you say it like that, Cheryl, aligned with partisan <laughs> politics, really? Um, no, really what's happened is over the course of the previous election campaign, you know, I was working as a political commentator. And as I was watching that campaign unfold, I was increasingly, and as I watched the first few months of the Danielle Smith premiership, I was increasingly uncomfortable with the direction of Alberta. I didn't intend to make an endorsement. Certainly I wrote some pointed columns. There was a series of four or five columns I wrote during the campaign. And, you know, a lot of them were basically saying, if you're someone who's always voted conservative, what are you to make of this premier who does not appear to be a premier that uh, Ralph Klein or Peter Lougheed would be comfortable uh, working with? And so I, I was going to stop it there. And then in the last week or so of the campaign, completely unplanned, you know, there were a bunch of things that sort of put me over the edge and said I need to be more pointed on this, partly because in talking to regular Albertans, and it will shock both of you to know that I have recently learned that there are people in Alberta who do not live, breathe, and think politics all day. Like, really? And there's <laughs> lots of them. Who, who are they? They're well, not on they're this podcast. They're pretty much every Albertan, as it turns out. <laughs> um, they may not be listening to this podcast, but they are pretty much every Albertan. And I realized that I was, A, being a bit subtle into what I was saying. I didn't think I was being subtle at all, but a lot of folks were saying, all right, so what do you mean by that? But then there were a few incidents, and one of them was the incident with the uh, UCP candidate um, who suggested that having trans kids in your school was like having poop in your cookies. And I remembered a conversation I had with Danielle Smith in the Lake of Fire incident um, back in that election when she called me and said, how do you think I should deal with this? And at that time, we really, I appealed to the values of the person I thought I knew. And she did, in fact, act. It took her a long time, but she did, in fact, act. And in this case, when it took her four or five days to actually denounce those really hateful comments about vulnerable children, I sort of went, you know, this is a different person than even the person who was the leader of the Wild Rose when I first became mayor. And I need to be more explicit about what I'm doing. And so I wrote that endorsement. And, you know, a lot of folks, Cheryl, as you know, you know, folks within the party were like, thank you. But also some of them were like, where'd that come from? You know, is that too little too late? Um, and if I had had a strategy around it, look, I would have done it earlier and I would have targeted it better. Did it help win a couple of marginal ridings in Calgary? You know, maybe it did. But ultimately, I felt the need to really have that conversation with Albertans. But then I was done. Then I was done. And going back into my role as a, as commentator, and I never say nonpartisan, I have opinions on everything. But, um, you know, into that role. But over the course of several months, a lot of Albertans have been reaching out to me saying you should do this. I started being hugely negative about it. And I'll tell you a quick anecdote, which is when it got really cold in January, we went into a electrical grid alert on a Friday. And I know a fair bit about the, the electrical grid and how it works and so on. So as soon as I saw that there was an electrical alert, I took to social media because I still have tons of followers just to let people know, all right, we're in an alert. This is what you need to do. You know, stop using your dishwasher or washing machine. Stop at mid-cycle if you need to. Unplug your vehicles um, and just delay using a ton of electricity until about 7 p.m. when the grid should be normalized. Uh, normal, practical, everyday um, information. And when I got online, I saw that this government, rather than giving people the information they needed to avoid blackouts when it was unspeakably cold, were taking this as an opportunity to beat up on the federal liberals. And look, I get it. Minister Stephen Gilbo is someone who just takes a poke and then he rises to the occasion and always takes the bait. I get it. It's very tempting. But you don't do that in the middle of an emergency. Uh, and so I tried to do the best I could, giving out the electricity equivalent of public health messaging. 
And then the next day, you know, the premier um, did the same thing. I basically said, thank you for giving people the information you need. And she very graciously put out a tweet thanking me for spreading the word. But then I thought to myself and I said, you know, I don't know if what I did yesterday influenced their actions, but that their the fact that their instinct wasn't to look after people, their instinct was to go political right away, really hit me hard. And I thought, what if it was an even bigger deal? You know, thank God we avoided those black burnouts, but people could have been at very serious risk. And then I thought about other things like the management of the ambulance system that's putting people at risk, the closure of rural emergency rooms over the holidays or on weekends because we don't have enough staffing, it's putting people at risk. And I hate to say this, I hate to say it because I'm so engaged in mental health and addiction and part of the Alberta model around treatment beds is probably the single best thing any provincial government has ever done, build more treatment beds and fully fund them for people who are looking to treatment. But we also have to call it the failed Alberta model. Our deaths have gone up and up and up from drug poisonings to the point where some months we have more deaths than they have in British Columbia, a much larger province. So it's not too much to say people's lives are at risk. And then for me, another blow was punching down on vulnerable children. It wasn't so much the trans policy, which is deplorable, but the fact that on her radio show that weekend, the premier basically talked about how she did a bunch of polling to figure out if this would be a popular move or not. You don't put human rights down to polls. And if you're actually polling, trying to figure out which vulnerable group it's okay to punch down on, and you pick children with a high risk of suicide, to me, that is a very big problem. And so that combined with all the people talking to me about this made me go, you know what? I was put on this earth to serve. I, I like, I, I hope that's why I was here. And this is where I'm called to serve now. And I hope that Albertans will see that as well. Okay, there was a lot to unpack there, and I'm going to push Sorry, back. No, that's that, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> Trust me, I love to hear. Like, I love to talk, so I get it. Um, and I appreciate that you went into those. I, I I want to ask some of the questions that we got from our listeners, but I do want to maybe call you out a little bit. One thing I sure. find because you know, and Cheryl and I go back and forth. I you know talk about the government's position. She talks about opposition. Not to say that her job is easier, but what I do find with the NDP is they don't come with solutions. They you yeah. know complain and complain and complain about what the government's doing and this is horrible and you talked about ambulance wait times family doctors um and i haven't got ever an answer that's not just like throw more money at the problem so maybe some of those things that you listed like if you could actually explain what you would do and what would be different i'd love for an ndp to actually answer that (laughs) now that you are an ndp (laughs) that's absolutely legit question and i appreciate it now i'm going to dodge it just a little bit at the beginning because one thing I do want to say is, and it's killing me, because if you know me, you know I want to get deep into the details on policy. That's me, right? Politics in full sentences, a journalist once said, I get full sentences. Why are there so many of them? <laughs> but I'm being very careful about this because I am running for premier eventually. But I also want people to understand the first job is leader of the opposition. And we don't know what the world is going to look like in three years when there is an election. So I think putting out very detailed policy and promises now that I can't keep is just not who I am. But I do tell you that there will be some solutions. So I'll talk about two things specifically. Let's start with ambulances. We knew this was going to happen. And we knew that with the change in dispatch, taking away local control of dispatch uh, and putting it towards AHS's centralized system, that that was going to increase dispatch times regardless of how many ambulances we had available. And we put solutions out on the table with the government around interfacility transfers, which they have now done, which they just uh, contracted out that service, which is basically ambulance services that take people from one hospital to another, but you don't need the lights and the sirens. It's not an emergency. We put that solution forward. We explained how local dispatch control and better work with firefighters would ensure that uh, life-saving Uh, People would be there very, very quickly because there's way more firefighters than there are paramedics. And that would allow paramedics to be freed up to focus on higher uh, priority calls. Uh, And that one piece around fixing dispatch, it's not at all the whole solution. We need more ambulances. We need more paramedics. No no question. Can I just ask it? That piece of understanding that you didn't want to work with the firefighters, you didn't see them as partners in what you were doing. And frankly, they're free because the city's paid for them and the province doesn't. And the fact that you wanted to de-integrate the first response system, firefighters, police officers, and 911 calls from the medical system, 
paramedics belong to AHS, not to first response system. Used, they used to belong to first response system. It was a really good example of how the government wasn't thinking about innovative solutions for all of this. Now, can I just so, jump in to get a clarification? You said we. Yeah, I ahead. just want to make sure that that's you talking as the former mayor, not we as the NDP, correct? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Me as the former mayor no, with, just, the other mayors, yeah. with the other mayors. Um, I couldn't speak for the NDP at that point, but I will tell you that I made the exact same arguments with Sarah Hoffman when she was the Minister of Health. And she had also come in with AHS telling her that she should get rid of local dispatch on the ambulances. But she listened to our arguments and she chose ultimately not to move forward. And we were able to keep the crisis at bay for a number of years until the UCP government came in and just wouldn't listen to anyone on that issue. Now, on another issue, I want to highlight that while I was mayor of Calgary for 11 years, and you know, lots of folks will say, oh, taxes went up a lot. But in fact, the government, the government of the city of Calgary was one of the most efficient governments anywhere. We were able to, in, to shoulder an increase in the population of Calgary of about 40% while maintaining the lowest residential property taxes in the country and keeping our service level, our service provision and citizen satisfaction very, very high. And was that a magic trick? Not really. What it was, was a real focus from the political side on the delivery of services. So I had at the beginning 20,000, at the end closer to 15,000 colleagues at the city of Calgary. And I would work with city administration every day to figure out how we could be more effective and more efficient by empowering people to stop doing dumb stuff, to focus more resources on the front lines, to digitize the provision of resources. Um, and in the end, we were able to provide services with as many city staff at the end of 11 years, an increase of 40% as we did at the beginning, which is kind of the opposite of how the provincial and federal governments have grown their civil services. So things like zero-based budgeting, priority-based analysis of the work we do, it sounds very technical, but it allows us to deliver better services at, at lower cost. And those are the kinds of conversations we need to have across government. Sometimes it is about throwing more money at it. You cannot massively increase the population of Alberta and not massively increase the number of teachers, doctors and nurses. But you can also find ways to do a better job instead of creating four levels of bureaucracy in Alberta Health Services where there was just one before. So I do appreciate that you talked about your your time as mayor because one of our listeners uh, had a question. I do want to point out that I think that in from 2010 to 2019, the size of the city administration increased by one billion, or uh, in terms of percentages, 35 percent. So I don't know. I know we don't have time yeah. to get into those details or where all mm -hmm. the money can go within the budget to be spent efficiently. But one of our listeners actually asked and said that you've had years since you've. Um, been out of politics since you've been mayor and wants you to reflect on your time how you would change what what you would change or how you've changed and grown since oh, that changed. job and if you could talk yeah, us through well, that a little bit um, I've shrunk a little um, so that's been good been able to focus a little more on my health um, though I did manage to wreck at my back a little um, but I've really had the, the the joy of perspective. You know, Erica, you know very well, and Cheryl, you know very well that when you're in the midst of it, when you're in the premier's office, you're putting out fires every minute of every day. And by the way, when you're the mayor of the city, when I say putting out fires, sometimes it's literally putting out fires because we run the fire department. Um, but sometimes you lose the ability to really step back and think about the long-term implications of the work you're doing. And when I was mayor, I used to call it uh, it comes from the seven habits of highly effective people. I used to call it quadrant two thinking, uh, that we had to focus on things that were important, but not urgent. In other words, it's not on fire today, but it's really important. And we always struggle. And I bet you guys, if I were to ask you in your times in government, you would say the same thing. You always struggled on the long-term priorities because something was on fire today. And so being away and being able to have that perspective on the city and on the province and on the country, I think has been really helpful for me um, you know, when I reflect back on the things that we did well, there's a lot of things that I'm proud of. When I reflect on the things we did poorly, you know, I'm still kind of mad about the Olympics. Uh, and I think hard about how, you know, right now we should have had the largest investment in affordable housing in our history, getting ready for the Olympics two years from now. Uh, and I think hard about my own culpability and how I manage that. But the other interesting thing about gaining perspective is I've learned things that I didn't know before. So one of the examples is, as you know, I've been spending a lot of time with someone who most people would have thought was my enemy uh, when we were on council, Jeremy Farkas. And I read something that Jeremy had written in the Calgary Herald this past weekend, and I was, I was very touched by it uh, when he basically said, look, 
we disagreed all the time. But I feel that he was a great leader. He always listened to me. He always gave me space. He always helped me try to be better, and he made me better. I'm paraphrasing the words, but to me, you know, even the, the reflection in the last two years, I would never have thought that that was the impact I was having on people. And as I talk to people in the community who who tell me about the impact I had on them over those years, you know, that is both humbling, but also helping me think about what I can do. You know, when I filmed my launch video, I filmed it on the street I grew up in, in Marlboro, which for those who don't know is East Calgary, a working class part of Calgary. And a man came up to me who looked a little, a little down on his luck. Hey, you, you know what your legacy was when you were mayor? And I honestly thought he was going to say, you know, high taxes, low to government, whatever, whatever the things that you hear. And he just looked me in the eye and he said, bare entry. Because of you, I can take the bus now. And because I can take the bus now, it's changed my entire life. And, you know, when you're doing it, when you're in the middle of it every day, you forget that it's really about people. And it's really about the impact that we can have on people. So I hope I've become a little more humble. Uh, I hope I've become a little more thoughtful. I hope I've become a little more long-term focused. But I've also been reminded that ultimately every day it's about people. It's not about the political game in any way. Um, pivoting a little bit back to sort of the NDP and how it is successful, because some of this comes down to how do we win in 2027? And there are a couple of places we know we fell short in 2023. And certainly one of them was support outside of Edmonton and Calgary. Mm. I'm really pl- proud of the support that we've built in Calgary. There's room to work to, to grow that. But in places outside those cities, we have tons of work to do. So if mm. you're the leader, how do you intend to appeal to those rural voters or those voters in smaller centers? Thanks so much. Uh, I'll answer a Calgary question real quick first, because I'm obsessed with that map behind you, um, (laughs) because I love maps. And, you know, if you're going to be super simplistic about it and you just take the map of where I won three times in Calgary geographically and overlay it against where the NDP lost close seats or lost period, well, the NDP would have a majority right there. But that's hugely simplistic thinking. I can't earn all those votes again and maybe I'll earn other votes again. It has to be much, much deeper than that. And since this is a political strategy podcast, maybe I can get a little more into the strategy than I normally would. I don't want to give away all my secrets because you're right there, (laughs) right there. But um, but I will say that the challenge that I had with the NDP political strategy going into the last election is that the party had carved out far too narrow a path to victory. Mm -hmm. So essentially, they had to win in every single riding that they were competitive in in order to get a bare majority yeah you you can't do that you got to you got to throw some uh some hail mary passes you got to be out there in a big way and so you know president obama famously in 08 was going into what he called a 50 state strategy he knew he probably wasn't going to win in nebraska but he was going to go to nebraska and he was going to be visible there and have his his candidates visible there and ultimately, you know, gain a majority in the House and so on and so on. And so I think we really need, we need what the progressive conservatives, the PCs have always had and what the UCP, I think, has, which is an 87 riding strategy. You know, one of the frustrations with the old PCs, I don't know if Erica would agree with me on this, but I used to say to Jim Prentiss and folks like that, you don't have a God-given right to every seat, you know? focus, target, Um, but they would continually say, look, we've got to be all things to all people, and this is the work that we have to do. So I do think that the NDP can learn a little bit of that and look at an 87 street seat strategy. You know, I look at a place like Red Deer, you know, and without being too uncharitable, you don't exactly have the two best MLAs in the legislature representing Red Deer North and Red Deer South. And the NDP had at least one or two, actually two, I should say, really, really good candidates in Red Deer. So you think about that and you go, okay, you've got good candidates, you've got kind of weak opponents, and in one and in both cases, very controversial opponents, but you couldn't bring it home. So what happened there? I don't know the full answer to that. I, I absolutely don't know the answer of what happened in the donut around Edmonton. We've got a pretty good answer on what happened in Calgary. But the fact that I don't have those answers really talks about the need to understand these places better. So look, I can easily say, you know, Danielle Smith says, I live in High River, I represent rural Alberta, right? I could easily say I grew up in Red Deer County and went to a school with its own rodeo. But that, which is true, but that is not enough to say that we really understand what's going on 
in these areas outside of Calgary and Edmonton. And I hesitate to use the word rural because, you know, people living in downtown Red Deer probably don't think of themselves as rural. But in the mid-sized cities and the smaller centers and in truly rural Alberta, it really is about sitting down and talking to people and understanding their concerns and really helping them, you know, uh, understand that there is a better opportunity out there. So if we can say to people in rural Alberta, look, you want the best for your kids. And right now, it's difficult to guarantee that there'll be an apprenticeship position or a college seat or a university seat for your kids when they finish high school. How frustrating it must it be for you to drive by two hospitals on the weekend with closed ERs to get to the hospital with an open ER, or the fact that we're sending our family doctors away out of rural areas, or the fact that we can't even pave the roads very well, or one that I've heard a lot in the last two days from people outside of big centers in Alberta is, please don't forget about us vis-a-vis -vis crime. You know, crime is a huge issue, and despite the UCP talking about rural crime, we haven't seen any real changes. And the other one that actually surprised me was the number of people who said to me, we've been promised broadband out here for 20 years and we still don't have it, even though we're 10 miles out of Calgary and we can't participate in the economy, especially in these post-pandemic times without that. How come we haven't been a priority for that? So there are, there are topics that we will learn and we need to talk to people and help them understand that. And sorry, Erica, I'm hesitant to say this, but you've heard me say it before. We need them to understand that the conservatives that they have always supported are not these conservatives. That this is not the party of Peter Lougheed and of Ralph Klein, and there are opportunities to do something better. I'm not sorry. Erica, would you like to pick up that. on that? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm going to ask actually ask you a question back yeah. um, and pivot away from that one a little bit because I, I've all still right. always identified as a conservative. I, okay. <laughs> um, and well, I think you've changed also your tone of those uh, MLAs from Red Deer as I heard you on Jesperson, uh, Jesperson this morning. I might have been a little meaner this morning. Um, I'm a little well, bit you're, better you're, yeah, you're just, uh, you, you become more polite as the day goes on. Um, I do want to ask two, two questions and I know Cheryl and I have a hypothetical for you after. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is, and this is, you know, me as a fiscal conservative, which I think you once identified as, um, saying that, uh, you know, you've seen the budget, you've seen what happened, you did mm -hmm. talk a little bit about your policies. Um, if you were the premier today and you were dealing with the, the financial situation we're dealing in, would you introduce a PS? This is a yes or no question, by the way. You can't, I'm not going to let you answer long. Would you introduce a PST or raise taxes? I would not introduce the PST. Um, I would have a conversation with Albertans about whether or not getting off the revenue roller coaster on oil and gas royalties on the tax side makes sense. You know, I'll remind you that if we had taxes today at the level that Ralph Klein had taxes at the end of his term, we'd have a balanced budget. But you, um, you I'm would... not suggesting that that's the right answer, but I am suggesting that if we have a government that cannot properly balance its budget with oil prices this high, we've got a structural problem that we've got to figure out. Okay, that wasn't yes or no, and I don't ever actually expect a politician to do a yes or no. Um, on the raising taxes, you would, under this government, have to um, repeal the the legislation that will, you know, that the government said that they are introducing. Uh, would you do that so that you would oh, be able you know, to raise taxes? I was, I, was I was critical of Jason Kenney when he was first elected and he did the summer of repeal and he repealed all the stuff from the NDP. I was like, there must be some good stuff in there. But in this case, there is a bunch of ridiculous performative stuff that this government has done that they have no intent of holding on to. For example, you're supposed to have a referendum for new taxes, but somehow we got a new EV tax um, in this uh, in this budget because they felt like it. I knew so, yeah, you'd of course, that I'm policy repeal. out of the other taxes. Of <laughs> course, levies. I'm going to repeal the performative <laughs> stuff that's, that doesn't mean anything, um, including the pension stuff, including... Uh, this performative stuff on taxes so that we can have grown up conversations. So, and I, I know Cheryl's has, has our hypothetical, she cues it up, but I do have to ask because as you know, my parties have had lots of leadership races and you coming in as a mayor and a non, you know, non-partisan, all of that. How are you going to shift from that mayor to how you'll deal with a caucus and a team? And I know you alluded to to Jeremy. Um, how are you going to make it like seamless? Because you're you're pretty late to the game, right? As as yeah. the the timeline goes, how are you going to pivot and become a you know more of a the team player or leadership candidate as opposed to mayoral? 
That's that's a great question, and I and I want to answer it. Can I just say one more thing about the budget, though? Um, which sure. is, I want to say one really good thing about the budget, which is, I think the fact that although it's confusing for people, and I don't think it was presented very well, I think the fact that we're thinking about the capital budget differently than the operating budget um, as we move forward, because investments in capital are just that investments. And you shouldn't think of them as part of your operating deficit. You shouldn't have operating deficits at all. But investing in capital makes sense. And that is, and sometimes makes sense. And that's how we ran our city budgets. I know Rachel tried to do that as Premier and ran into just a wall of criticism. And I'm so interested that Premier Smith didn't run into a wall of criticism when she just did it anyway. But it is a really smart thing to do. And I think that those are the things we can pick up on in budget. So now now to your actual question. Yeah. I was going to say, that you is know, interesting. You took me down memory lane to uh, Doug Horner and Alison Redford when they started doing uh, planning and budgeting accordingly because of, for our, our oh, listeners. Oh, you know, that's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah, it was said, like three I just years. Said that Rachel Notley ran into a wall of criticism, but it was Alison Horner. It Redford was. I was going to say, I'm like, I still got some PTSD from that. But, um, you yeah, know, three you and five reminder. years. No, of I had course. Six but it's... Years. I'm, I'm losing track. <laughs> <laughs> but the infrastructure, and again, Again, like for, for our listeners, it does take in a capital budget, you put the amount for the amount of like construction or infrastructure for that school that might take or a hospital that might take three or five years. And so just correct me if I'm wrong, Ned, that that's what you're talking about is that's, how that's that exactly you do right. count it over well, three there's years. There's two things. So number one is that even in the city, um, and they changed it under Mayor Von Kanye just before I started, you know, you'd have a project that would take five years to build and it would take five years to put the money out, but you'd have to take all of that money in your first year. And in the city, you could still call it part of your capital budget, but in provincial budgeting, so let's say you're building a $100 million interchange, you have to actually take that against your operating deficit in that year. And I hate deficits and I hate debt. It just comes from growing up poor and being a first generation Canadian. But sometimes you wanna get a mortgage if you wanna get a house for your family. And the problem we had was we'd have to put that $100 million and it would show up in the deficit for that year, even if the money wasn't being spent. And it really confused the issue of whether we were spending more than we were taking in. So I'm really happy to, sorry to get so nerdy about it, but I'm <laughs> happy to see uh, those sort of changes go forward. Now on your question on being a team player, I'll just, I'll just jump to that real quick here. You know, I have this reputation and I know why I have this reputation. It's because I'm a really big guy with a really big mouth who takes up the oxygen in the room. And I strongly suspect I know what Cheryl's hypothetical will be. And this will be the same answer to that hypothetical because everyone's asking me this question. Um, but however, when you're the mayor, you're just one vote. And, you know, as Mayor Gondek has found out, sometimes that one vote doesn't carry a lot of the day. So you have to get seven people to come along with you, at least seven people in the case of Calgary. And I had an ideologically massively diverse council. And most mayors followed a strategy of, I get seven or eight of them on my side and I don't really care about the other ones. And I never did that. I'll admit that I did that a little bit at the very end during COVID just because we had so much stuff we had to get through and get done. But prior to that, I really let the ideas carry the day. I really had the people debate it out and try and get the ideas to come better. And as Jeremy says, he really felt listened to. And some of the others got real mad at me because I was that nice to Jeremy. But I think you had to do it. So building the team in that way, I think, was very important. Now, I really, in the time I've taken to make this decision, right, and the, I really took advantage of the fact that I had time. It wasn't, you know, some people are speculating that the party was trying to freeze me out or putting me through a bunch of hoops. It wasn't that at all. Uh, the party infrastructure was super welcoming, but it does take some time to go through the vetting, especially when you're me. My favorite question on the vetting, does anyone hold a grudge against you? <laughs> You said no. Well, yeah, I was NA, the mayor right? for 11 years. <laughs> <laughs> Is there enough paper? Um, but um, but I really, I knew that that would take some time. And I had some other things in my real life, because I'm, I'm not a professional politician. I actually have a career. I had some things in my real life that I had to finish off, and I'm still finishing off. Uh, but I took that opportunity to talk to a ton of people, including a ton of caucus members. And every single one of them asked me this question about caucus management. And, you know, I think both of you, Erica and Cheryl, you will know that if you talk to any MLA or MP from any party, how do you feel about the leader? How do you feel about caucus management? You will always get the exact same answer. You guys know what it is. I wish I had more time with the leader. Yep. Uh, you know, I wish that I could actually say that I had a better relationship with the leader. You hear it no matter what. And I heard it even, even with Rachel, who I know has worked hard on caucus building. I heard it a lot from these caucus members as well, but you always hear it. Mm -hmm. And it confuses me. 
because I'm always like, you know, that's your first and primary stakeholder group. Just make the time, right? But in these conversations, I really listened. And what I've said to folks is, listen, I can't promise you that you're going to get everything you want. The NDP is a big house now, and there's lots of people with lots of different opinions. But what I can promise you is that you'll always get a fair hearing, that you'll be able to air your ideas at caucus without fear of risk or retribution, and that we'll make a decision together. I can't promise you it'll be one member, one vote at caucus on every single thing, because ultimately the leader needs to have judgment on what's happening, but I can promise you you'll be heard. And what's interesting to me is I've so far announced four caucus members who have endorsed me. And if you believe in traditional left and right, I have both the most left-wing caucus member and the most right-wing caucus member who have endorsed me together, which I think is really interesting. So, you know, Rod Loyola, who is, you know, pretty... uh, Very (laughs) anti-police. Social Democrat as you can get, right, Um, has jumped in. And Samir Kayande, who will not stop talking about uh, his experience as a financial economist and his experience <laughs> in the energy sector uh, is also in there. And Cord Ellingson, who, of course, was the chief economist of Calgary Economic Development, uh, and the fourth one being Parmeet Bopri, my MLA, uh, who is serving as one of my talk, uh, campus uh, caucus co-chairs, who's all about community outreach. So I really love the fact that we have been able to get folks from across the spectrum within the party to get excited about what I stand for. And I hope that I'll continue to do that with the caucus. Okay, well, well, let's throw you some hypotheticals quick. I have one Ready. and then Erica has one. And then we will we'll get you on your way because we know you're a busy guy before. But before we let you go, we want to hear a quick elevator pitch. So sure. before we get to that, a hypothetical, let's say you win the NDP leadership. Mm-hmm. What do you do on day one? And then what do the next three years look like? Because you're running to be the leader of the official opposition. Day one? We sit down with the caucus and talk to them about our common goals and what we want to do together. We make sure that we uh, we really put out any elephants in the room if there were hurt feelings or things that happened during the race to understand that we are a team and we're going to work together. We do the same with the incredibly dedicated volunteers in the party from the provincial executive and throughout the leadership of the party and really say, how are we going to work together? and build that welcoming environment with the understanding that Rachel Notley and her team and people like Cheryl Oates have worked really hard to build this magnificent house. But if I'm the leader, not only will you always have a place in this home, but we are also going to open the doors so other people have a place in this home. And that would be day one, day one. Um, Externally, it would mean building on the speech I would have made the night before, which would have been to all Albertans telling them about their home in the NDP and helping understand that. Then the next three years, look, this was a hard thing for me thinking about whether I wanted to throw my hat in. This is not a short-term commitment. And I thought to myself, I don't like campaigning to begin with. What's a three-year long campaign look like? But I was really convinced that that is a tremendous opportunity to go to those, stereotypically, to go to those A&Ws and Tim Hortons in every place in the province to have those conversations to go into people's homes you know i'll give you an example and just south of calgary is the constituency of highwood it's very stereotypically conservative constituency the ndp got 30 percent there last time and with a candidate who i think came in quite late in the game and that means that a third of the people in highwood are really already having this conversation And how do we have that conversation with their neighbors? How do we convince them to bring their neighbors to their house for a coffee party where we can talk in a risk-free, calm way about how to build a better Alberta, how to build a a more optimistic Alberta for the future? So, So that would be three years of that, three years of that. You know, people think the job of the leader of the opposition is to stand there in question period and ask really tough pointed questions. But to me, it's much more about building a vision with all Albertans. As you share your vision and optimistically share things, I'm going to be the pessimist and say, hypothetically, if you don't win the NDP leadership, will you be running a, uh, for the NDP in 2027? Well, let me start out by saying, you know, everyone, a lot of people for some reason are thinking that this is a coronation, this is a cakewalk. I would like to remind everyone that I am so far from the front runner here that until yesterday morning, I hadn't sold a single membership. Um, so there's a lot of work to do. So your hypothetical, Erica, is is not unlikely, right? And the answer is pretty straightforward. 
I will do what I can to help build a better Alberta within the movement, as long as the movement wants me there. And the reason that I'm sounding a bit uh, evasive on this question is very straightforward. It's what I said before. I'm pretty self-aware. I'm a big guy. I take up a lot of oxygen. I get my big clown shoes all over everything uh, as I get into things. So really, that would be a conversation I would have with the new leader if I were to lose. And I would ask her, how can I be more useful to you in your goal of unseating this government and building a government that all Albertans can be more proud of? And she might say to me, look, I want you to run. Uh, and I'll run. But she might say to me, I don't need that distraction of having you in the room, but there are other ways you can help. And that's a conversation we would have. I will point out you said she, and I don't know if uh, that means you're Love counting that. out Gil. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, I know I he hasn't officially. I don't like using yeah. him or her. Um, and I will point out, yes, there is another male candidate. So sorry, Gil, I shouldn't have uh, shouldn't have been that. But you know, he's how not many official yet, though. In your defense, <laughs> when we met, he and he or she, you know, mm-hmm. let's use she when we meet he or she. Love it. Um, okay, we know you're a busy guy. We really by the way, I did love time. Rocky Pancholi's comment yesterday. In fact, I loved all of their comments yesterday. I thought they were so sassy. I loved when Sarah Hawkins <laughs> said, "We welcome him to the race, and I hope he's happy coming in second. And I yeah, loved when yeah, Rocky like Pancholi that. said, "Let the best woman win." Yeah, that that was great. Um, before we let you go today, we just wanted to give you thirty seconds to just, if you can, because that might be the hardest part for you since you politics in full sentences. Uh, thirty seconds, just your elevator pitch to straight to um, the membership right now to Alberta NDP. Members. So look at Cheryl, not me, when you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> But, but Erica, I want you to understand that there's a brighter future for you, oh, too. I, I under, underhand pitched that, too. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take it. Come over, Erica. Come over. <laughs> Only my hair is orange. <laughs> and, and you'll be a great senator, too, but we'd love to have you. Thank you for, thank you for that so, one. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> so with that said, I want to say that I was overwhelmed yesterday by the feedback and by the excitement of people across Alberta. And to me, that made me understand that really there is a hope and a desire in Alberta for a better place. You know, for so long in Alberta, we've become against. We're against Ottawa. We're against people who want to come in and change our way of life. We're against the changes in the world that are happening that we're uncomfortable with. And it's time to be for. It's time to be for Alberta. It's time to be for in Alberta that it has strong public services, that builds an economy of prosperity for everyone, that takes real action on climate change, that safeguards public services, that looks after the most vulnerable. And that's really what I'm about. And if you want that, if you want to be able to unseat this government and build a better Alberta, then we have to vote for a government that is for Alberta and a government that is for all of us. Nahed Nenshi, thank you so much for spending so much time with us and your thoughtful answers. We really appreciate you coming on the discourse today. Thank you. Take care. Well, there's no doubt Nahed Nenshi entering the race certainly changes the dynamics of the race, which up until now has been a number of sitting female MLAs. And we know Gil McGowan has also declared he'd like to run for the leadership. But Nenshi, seen as a nonpartisan outsider, certainly changes first the profile of the race and that people are talking about it, but also the internal dynamics um, from a, a team that's been working together for a long time. Now we have someone who's seen as an outsider join the fray. Yeah, I actually thought when he was talking, the most interesting thing is he doesn't see himself as a front runner. But if you're reading the news outlets um, and and reporting on his announcement, there's actually most people are pegging him that. So do you think that's his strategy to like come in humble and not be the the front runner? Or do you think that that's actually like how he feels? I I don't actually think he is the front runner. I think that he, like he says, is like he's a big personality. He has a ton of Twitter followers and he has this ability to pull national media interest that perhaps his opponents don't have. But no one in Toronto is voting in the NDP leadership. So despite the fact that he is certainly today winning the air war, that doesn't necessarily translate into votes. And for those who declared their candidacy right out of the gate and for those that have been building relationships and credibility inside the membership for months, if not years, if not decades, like that is a lot for him to make up before the deadline for memberships next month. Yeah, I mean, 
I, I actually agree. I've always thought um, that Sarah Hoffman was the front runner, uh, especially when you look at like what the Alberta NDP look like. Um, we've seen the strategy of others try to like really branch out the party and things like that. But I think the stronghold actually does go to to Sarah. And, and it, she was the one that was like of absolute no surprise that she was running. Remember in my political who's who compared to conservative, she's the Travis Taves. I think, you know, they, they deemed him the front runner uh, for lots of the campaign and then an outsider won. So uh, who knows how this will go, but it's definitely, um, you know, great to hear what he has to say. And so early on in his uh, bid. So I'm sure we'll have many of these guys back on to see see how it's going out there. And I think, too, like that maybe this is why the UCP have so many leadership races, because for me as a new Democrat and someone who hasn't decided how I'm voting, just the the fact that people are talking about the race, the fact that it is so exciting, the fact that the people who are running to be leader of the NDP are being looked at as potential next premiers. That is so incredible for the party and really a testament to how much it's grown over the last decade. And I like watching it. I'm just thinking maybe the UCP, this is why they keep moving their leaders out. They just want people to talk about the party and get excited about it. I can confirm that that is not why people <laughs> uh, stop being the leader. But I think that something Nahed had brought up was the importance of caucus. And I have seen some premiers I worked with and for have great caucus relations and some not so much. And I do think, I mean, this is not biased because I'm comparing it to all the premiers I've worked with and for. Daniel Smith actually has a very good caucus relationship and sits down and listens to them. And from my understanding, I think Rachel does as well. And so that is a huge piece of the leadership that I think Mm -hmm. members are going to have to look at and what that looks like. Um, you know, on that day one of how do you bring everyone together? How do you bring every camps? Like, I mean, I moved up to Edmonton, worked on Gary Mars campaign, Alice and Redford won, and I got a job, right? Like that was part of the, the bringing the fold in of all the people that worked really hard on a campaign. Um, so, you know, I think it's a fair question to ask everyone is you might be in that caucus room, but how are you going to be the leader of a, the caucus and change from being a colleague to the boss? And I think, like, honestly, his answer, there are some political leaders that actually never even get that far. Mm-hmm. They never figure out how big of an, how important a stakeholder their own caucus and their own MLAs are or their own membership or volunteers that they have to actually carve out time in their calendar to keep that group of people happy because without them, they can't be successful. There are political leaders who never learn that and never do that. And I think there's I think some there conservative of- premiers that learn that after the fact. The hard like, way. I mean, yeah. And I think some people watch Nahed right now and say, well, what does he know about managing a caucus? He was a mayor. Mm -hmm. Um, But even in in that comment, he demonstrates some awareness, more awareness than lots of provincial leaders ever have. So who do you think is his biggest competition? Because from knowing, you know, the purple being um, conservative and liberal combined, like red and blue combined, him being more centrist than he would be traditionally left. But I think his his person to beat is Hoffman. Like, who is he going to go? You got Ganley and Racky or and Pancholi kind of in the middle. Like, what's his membership going to be that he's going after? Or like, how is he going to um, not just easily chomp at some of their people they'll bring in, but actually bring in new new blood to the party? Yeah, I think, I mean, he is the best position to br- bring in new people, for sure. Like, it, uh, he uh, he puts out, like he said, he puts his map over Calgary and he can win over ridings, potentially, that the NDP hasn't held before. So if he, he's going after new membership, um, Sarah Hoffman will obviously be building the membership, but has been like I said, spending decades building one-on-one relationships with lots of the existing members. And so they're probably not eating as much of each other's pool as some of the other candidates. Okay, so before we we close this out, I was just looking at the um, the date. Remind me, is it the 14th or 15th they've got to have their... Like, what's this next step and how we'll really know? So I know some people have officially filed with their signatures, their money, all of that, um, mm-hmm. and some haven't. So what does that look like this week? So we'll know, we'll know on Friday who is officially in and who is not. Like, this is the de- declaration deadline, and you also have to have your signature submitted to the party uh, by the 15th. So we'll know by Friday who's officially in this race and 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 who's not. And if there's any last-minute people who haven't mentioned themselves yet and want to poke their heads up, they have only a day left to do it. So then we know who's, like, officially coming on the show as an NDP yeah. candidate. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, anything else you, you want to throw out there? 
You can ask me That's about it. all the secrets to, to leadership. Yeah, races. can we have some we, lessons learned on another episode? We'll do lessons learned over the years of UCP, <laughs> PC, Wild Rose leaderships. Can't oh, wait. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, that is it for our show. As you know, uh, we're out every Thursday morning. Please like, subscribe, and follow us on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. The Discourse is hosted by Cheryl Oates and Erica Barudis. Follow on Instagram at The Discourse Pod. Subscribe to The Discourse on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts.